Good morning. Sorry, I didn't mean to make you jump there. <laughs> and welcome. Lovely to see you. Welcome if you're visiting. Welcome if you're a regular. Welcome if you are participating online as well. That is lovely. A special welcome to our baptismal family this morning, to William, who's going to be baptized, and his brother Roy, and parents Katie and Richard, and the rest of the extended family. We are delighted you managed to brave through the remaining growls of the beast from the east uh, to get here, and thanks to all of the rest of you who managed to make it here today as well. And if you're watching at home, you may have made a sensible decision, and you can enjoy it from there. We're continuing with our theme of promise as well as we go through Lent. We started with the promise of faithfulness through the story of Noah, the promise of belonging through the story of Abraham, and today we're going to be looking at the promise of order, not through a direct covenant with God so much as through the Ten Commandments and how we understand those. Uh, a small mention for the, the parents here, kids are welcome to stay for the whole service, absolutely, but if anybody gets just too restless for your own comfort, you're welcome to nip out either door downstairs into the chapel and there'll be things they do. But we have colouring and stuff to entertain folk during the, the talky bits, so, um, so hopefully we'll all be able to stay together. The heavens tell of the glory of God and display his handiwork, without speech, without words, Yet their voice goes out throughout the world, calling us to worship the Lord. Let's sing together our opening hymn, which is singing, we gladly worship the Lord together.
thank you. And I should have made, I absolutely, Roy, I should have made mention of the fact that there is space to dance the way we've set it up today. So if anybody should feel so inspired during any of the songs, they are more than welcome to have a wee dance. We'll come before God with our opening prayer. First of all, at the end of the prayer, we usually say the Lord's Prayer. The particular translation we use appears on the screen, but you're also welcome to use whatever is most familiar to you. Let us pray. Lord God, what a gift it is to worship you, to be here among friends, old and new, near and far, but all drawn together to worship you through word and sacrament and song. You are the warmth when we come in from the cold, the blaze of spirit which takes away the chill of the wind, the promise of spring beneath the drifts. Forgive us for the times when we stop looking for your promise, stop leaning into your warmth, and instead choose to manage our lives as if you were simply an add-on, an optional extra rather than the foundation of our being. Forgive us also for when we refuse to follow the directions of Jesus, preferring to advance our own comfort rather than help those who are struggling. Give us a passion for you this morning, Lord, and a compassion for others that outlasts this hour and takes us through the weeks to come. Help us not just to wait for the spring, but to be the spring, even in the midst of the cold, nurturing hope and encouragement and life in those we meet. Hear us as we pray together. Our Heavenly Father, may your holy name be honoured. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today what we really need. Forgive us the wrong we do as we forgive those who wrong us. Lead us away from temptation. Keep us safe from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours forever. Amen. I don't know how everybody, how is everybody coping with the beast from the east? It's been a bit difficult getting out and about, hasn't it? For some people particularly. And I noticed this morning that I didn't have much left in my fridge, so I kind of dashed out without breakfast. So I hope you don't mind, but I thought I might just make myself something, a wee lunch while we're here. Are there any younger ones, small ones, who can come up to the table and help me make something? Because I need to, I'm just, I'm just getting hungry, so I need to, you can bring your parents up if you want to. Are you gonna come, come help me, Roy? This is great, we need to get this ready, okay. Anybody else want to join? I think we'll put a tablecloth on, shall we? Can you help me, Roy, you take that end? Oh, we've got some other helpers. Here we go. We're going to put this on the table. Oh, there we go. That's to save making too much mess. You girls are going to come help me? That's great. Okay, brilliant. Right, now, I think I've got... What have I got here? I've got a roll. That will be good. Oh, oh I've got plenty of help. That's great. So I think we should start... I think we should start, shouldn't we, by buttering the roll. That's a good plan, isn't it? Okay, so here we go. Here we go. Buttering the roll. What's wrong? I'm squishing it. Well, did, did I forget? Oh, I'm squishing it. Oh, dear. Did, did I forget to do something? You have to open it. I forgot to cut it open. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. Oh, okay, hang on. I'll get another one. Okay, so the first step is to cut it open, you said. Okay. I'm glad I've got you guys helping me. Otherwise, goodness knows what I would end up doing. Here we go. Okay. So, there we go. Now we'll butter it. That's good, isn't it? That's better. Okay, now I've got some stuff in it. Let me see. Oh, I've got some cheese. At least this claims to be cheese. So we'll just put this in the... What? What? Oh. Oh, I forgot to take the plastic off. Oh, silly me. Gosh, it's difficult when you get these things in the wrong order, isn't it? Okay, okay, that's it, that's cheese. I'm not sure it'll taste much different without the plastic, but there we go. Oh, what else? Oh, I know what I'm going to do. Here, I'll put a tomato in. Yeah! Yeah, it's not what? what? It, it's not good like that? No, you have to cut it. I have to cut it. Oh, goodness. Okay, okay. Right, let's see. I've got a cutting board there. Have I got anything else? Um, hmm. We'll see what we can do. Ugh. Cut it. Cut it, okay. And now put it on top, yeah? No! no. Oh, okay, okay, what do I do? 
Oh, those two pieces. Leave that one then. Okay, put those two pieces in there. There we go. Okay, thank you guys. You can go back to your seat. It's good to get things in the right order, isn't it? Because sometimes, actually, come to think of it, I think I feel a little awkward eating my sandwich in front of you. So I'll maybe leave that. If anybody gets hungry during the service, you're welcome to come and have a wee sandwich. It is good to get things in the right order, though. Sometimes it really matters. So I'm really glad I had your guys' help. Otherwise, I would have been eating a squashed roll with plastic cheese and a whole tomato, and I suspect I'd have, I'd have made a big mess. Absolutely. Feel free to run around. There's no problem at all. Sometimes we have ways of keeping track of things being in the right order, like music. It's important to get it in the right order. As Eric Morecambe famously said, I'm playing all the right notes, just not necessarily in the right order. Yeah. Absolutely. So anybody know what your musical notes are, how you remember the notes on the stave? Every good boy deserves football. Okay, do you know I've heard deserves fun, deserves fudge, deserves football. Absolutely, that's how you remember the lines. And the spaces, do you remember how to remember the spaces? What do they spell? Face, absolutely, thanks to our musicians. But what are other ways that we have of trying to remember things? Like colors in the rainbow. Who knows the colors in the rainbow? Do you guys know what your colors in the rainbow? Red, yeah? Roy G. Biv, that's the one that I remember my kids learning when they were small. Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Yeah, that makes a rainbow, doesn't it? I know, it's great, isn't it? So we have these ways of remembering. According to a um, website I looked at, it's also important to get the order that you put your makeup on right. So just in case anybody's been doing it wrong, here's the order. Cleanser, toner, spot cream, serum, eye cream, moisturizer, oil, sun cream, primer, foundation, concealer, powder, bronzer, blusher, eyeshadow, eyeliner, mascara, and brows. That must take considerably longer than the three and a half minutes that my morning routine, uh, break, uh, makeup routine tends to take. It does make a difference though sometimes when we get things in the right order. And our first reading this morning is one that contains the Ten Commandments. And the idea of the Ten Commandments is not so much the idea of a rule book. It's something that God gave to the people of Israel when they had just newly found freedom as a as a guideline for them to be able to live well. And when I was looking around for things to do with things in the right order, I ran across a piece of advice on one of these time management type sites. And their piece of advice was for managing your time was always do the most important thing as your first task of the day. So with that instruction in mind, let's listen to our first reading about the Ten Commandments and notice what is the first thing that we are to do. Okay. Our first reading today is taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, reading from verses 1 to 17. And this can be found on page 76 of the Pew Bibles. God spoke, and these were his words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, where you were slaves. Worship no God but me. Do not make for yourselves images of anything in heaven or on earth or in the water under the earth. Do not bow down to any idol or worship it, because I am the Lord your God, and I tolerate no rivals. I bring punishment on those who hate me, and on their descendants down to the third and fourth generation. But I show my love to thousands of generations of those who love me and obey my laws. Do not use my name for evil purposes, for I, the Lord your God, will punish anyone who misuses my name. Observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. You have six days in which to do your work, but on the seventh day, 
sorry, but the seventh day is a day of rest dedicated to me. On that day, no more, no one is to work, neither you, your children, your slaves, your animals, nor the foreigners who live in your country. In six days, I, the Lord, made the earth, the sky, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, I rested. That is why I, the Lord, blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Respect your father and your mother so that you may live a long time in the land that I am giving you. Do not commit murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not accuse anyone falsely. Do not desire another man's house. Do not desire his wife, his slaves, his cattle, his donkeys, or anything else that he owns. Amen. So did you notice which is the most important, the first commandment? The first thing, the most important thing we are to do is to worship God and God alone. It's the beginning of an orderly existence. It's not the kind of order that restricts, but it's one that offers us safe boundaries in which to flourish as a community. And in many ways, we enact that in worship when we go through these patterns of praise and thanksgiving and confession and thinking of others. And we always begin our, our time together with a call to worship. Now this desire for a child to have an orderly beginning, to be acknowledged and welcomed in a community of love, is part of what brings families for baptism. So we are delighted to be able to baptize William this morning and to welcome him and family and friends today. So we're going to move into the baptism part of the service and we'll begin by singing All Things Bright and Beautiful. The congregation may have a sense of deja vu because we sang this last week as well. That's not a mistake. This was a, a, fa a family request from the Strachan family and it's one we always like to sing. So let's sing together All Things Bright and Beautiful.
Thank you. And again, as I said, there's no problem at all if we ones want to wander about. There's, there's plenty of, of, of things for them to do and they can go sit with somebody else and they'll be perfectly happy to entertain them, everybody. So, the Gospel tells us that Jesus was baptized in the Jordan by John. As he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens break open and the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And a voice from heaven came and said, You are my beloved Son, in you I take delight. Jesus himself said, let the children come to me. Do not try to stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, whoever does not accept the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it. Just as God delighted in his son Jesus, and Jesus delighted in the children who approached him, so does God delight when we approach him, seeking new life for ourselves and for our children. Jesus' baptism was complete when he died and rose again. Our baptism is a sign of dying to sin and rising to new life in Christ. It's also a reminder of the power of Christ's living water in us, which cleanses and heals, nourishes and protects. We are baptised by Christ. By the Spirit, he makes us members of his body, the Church, and calls on us to share the ministry in the world. By water and the Holy Spirit, God claims us as his own, each of us loved and remembered, washed clean and set free to live a life of freedom and order. In this sacrament, God's love is offered to each one of us. Though we can't understand it or explain it, we're called to accept that love with the openness and trust of a child. In baptism, William is assured of the love that God has for him, and the sign and seal of the Holy Spirit is placed upon him. So strong is that love and that seal that we describe it as being grafted onto Christ, the way a young plant is grafted to a stronger one, in order to grow and to flourish. Richard and Katie, would you please stand? In presenting this child for baptism, desiring that he may be grafted into Christ as a member of his body, the Church, do you receive the teaching of the Christian faith which we confess in the Apostles' Creed? Would the congregation please stand? And if you, if you wish to, then I would invite you to join in with the words of faith of the Apostles' Creed. Come up here, there we go. We believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated, but Katie and Richard, if you just come forward here. I invite you, if you wish, to keep your eyes open for this prayer as we bless the water. Holy, loving God, we thank you for your gifts of water and the Holy Spirit. As you remember William and each one of us, so we remember you. How you created life and life and order out of the formlessness of chaos. How you formed us in the beginning, in your likeness. How you made a covenant, a promise with us and rescued us time and again whenever we went astray. How you sent Jesus, the living embodiment of your covenant, to be the way, the truth, and the life. How you commanded us to follow him in baptism and in love for one another. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this water, that William, being buried with Christ in baptism, may rise with him to newness of life, and being born anew of water and the Holy Spirit, 
may remain forever in the number of your faithful children, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be glory and honour now and forever. William, for you, Jesus came into the world. For you, he lived and showed God's love. For you, he suffered the darkness of Calvary. For you, he lived and died and rose into newness of life. For you, he sits on the right hand of God the Father. All this he did for you, though you do not know it yet. And so the words of scripture are fulfilled. We love because God loved us first. William Michael Khalil Strachan, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit come down upon you and live in your heart forever. Well done! Well done! William is now baptized into the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Now I'm going to take William for a little walk around the, around the congregation so everybody can, can say hello to him while we sing the blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you. Please be seated. <laughs> so as we said, William is now baptised into Jesus Christ. He now belongs to God in Christ. From this day he will be at home in the Christian community where he will always belong. Tell him about today, about his welcome in the community here, let him see the value of what he's been given, so that he may know he's baptised, and as he grows, may make his own response in faith and love, and come in due time to share in the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Richard and Katie, could you stand for your second promise, please? Do you promise, depending on the grace of God, to teach this child the truths and duties of the Christian faith, and by prayer and example, to bring him up in the life and worship of the church. Thank you. The congregation is also expected to make a commitment when we baptize a child into our community. And so as we gather around William and his family, I'd invite you all to stand and we'll say this welcome in a moment. We who are gathered here represent the whole church. Word and sacrament bring us the joy of Christ's presence among us. They also bring us responsibilities as Christ's people in this place. So let's say together these words of welcome and commitment. Now we welcome William and renew our commitment with God's help to live in a kind and Christian way, to share with all God's children the knowledge Let us pray. God of love, once again we have received your grace in word and sacrament. Once again we have heard your call and are made new in your spirit. Once again we are reminded that we belong to you. Father and mother of us all, guide and guard William all his days. May your love hold him, your truth guide him, your joy delight him. May he learn to share your joy in him that he may share that joy with others. 
May he grow up secure in your commandment to love and be loved. Secure in the belief that you want him to flourish within your good order. Bless his parents, Richard and Katie, brother Roy and their extended family, that they may create a secure and happy home in which William can flourish. Give to his family wisdom and courage, laughter and peace, strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow, and the love that endures all things. God of grace, help us to profess with our whole lives the truth that there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and to live in love and unity with all who are baptized in his name and all whom you call us to serve in order that we might be a blessing to all the nations. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So welcome. We've got a couple of uh, small traditions that we have started um, doing here. Uh, first of all, Katie, there's a little posy of flowers for you that you can take away. Secondly, we've started um, creating what we're calling jars of blessings. So there's little slips of paper around the, the place. And if you haven't got any on your seat, they'll, they'll be, I think Ken's got some spare ones there. And that's an opportunity to write a little blessing for William and pop it in the jar. So if the service is over, you can just come in and, and pop it in. And that's just something for, for him to have as time goes on and as you're thinking back to the baptism, you can remember, um, remember. And the official bit too is the certificate of baptism, which you guys can look after. We're going to sing again now. We're going to sing a song that reminds us of what our, uh, I spoke about the responsibilities that, that, that we have been given. And so we'll sing together a song that, that speaks of those responsibilities. When I needed a neighbor, were you there? Uh, coloring stuff down just in case anybody's feeling like it would feel slightly awkward going forward to the front. So kids, if you want to do any coloring, there's also a word search there for older ones if you want to do something that's welcome. And there's toys at the back. Thank you, Ken. That might be even more exciting than coloring. They're up by the IT desk, yeah? Yeah, Alan, that's probably a good plan. You just bring the toys down, just pop them in the middle, and then anybody who wants to can amuse themselves during the, the talky bits to come. And if anybody older wants to play with the toys, well, you know, the space is there. But let's listen. <laughs> Our second reading for today is New Testament reading taken from John, chapter 2, reading from verses 13 to 22. And this can be faith found on page 118 of the Pew Bibles. 
It was almost time for the Passover festival, so Jesus went to Jerusalem. There in the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep and pigeons, and also the money changers sitting at their tables. So he made a whip from cords and drove all the animals out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He overturned the tables of the money changers and scattered their coins. And he ordered those who sold the pigeons, Take them out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that the scripture says, My devotion to your house, O God, burns in me like a fire. The Jewish authorities replied with a question, What miracle can you perform to show us that you have the right to do this? Jesus answered, Tear down this temple, and in three days I will build it again. Are you going to build it again in three days? they asked him. It has taken 46 years to build this temple. But the temple Jesus was speaking about was his body. So when he was raised from death, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture, scripture and what Jesus had said. Amen. Thanks, Ken. Let us pray. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your eyes. Amen. So in a sense, there's two ways we could look at the Ten Commandments. We can look at them as a set of personal instructions, or we can look at them as something that was given to the community as a resource. Both of these have their place, but in a highly individualistic society like ours, I think it's sometimes important to redress the balance and to focus a little bit on the community side of things. So the Ten Commandments were given to a people who had been released from slavery into freedom. But that freedom was difficult. They weren't used to it. They had been liberated, but they were still wandering in the wilderness. They needed a new mindset, a new root map, which would help shape them into a functioning community. Now, according to the Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann, the Ten Commandments aren't about setting up some stern morality or scolding people for bad behavior. Instead, they're a basic statement about how to organize social power and social goods for the benefit of all the community. They're meant for the common good of all. So, for example, let's take one that most people know. We're not to use the name of God for evil purposes, or as many people will recognize it in older translations, not to use the name of the Lord in vain. When I started the early stages of training for ministry, I was at the same time involved in an amateur production. And my fellow actors didn't know what I did during my day job until the night of the closing party. And it was quite comical to see the expression on a few of their faces as they tried to work out what they might have said in the past and whether they had to watch their language very carefully over the next few days. These days, when I'm wearing my collar and going out and about, I also get sometimes a sudden start of surprise or somebody giving their, their husband or wife or son or daughter a dirty look because they've said something in my presence, something colorful. The fact is, I'm not particularly offended by most swearing. A lot depends on the context and the intentions behind it. And I watch programs with plenty of bad language if it seems to fit the story and the context and it's done well. But I also like being someone who doesn't swear much. As a minister, the words I speak matter to people, and it's important, therefore, that I choose them well. Although it was actually motherhood rather than ministry which trained me out of some of the choicer words I may have used back in my theatre days. But we're missing something if we think that this commandment not to use God's name for evil purposes is simply about bad language. We use the word oath to mean both a promise or a swear word. And I suspect that the use of God's name to make a promise that we have no intention of keeping 
or to try to give an unjust or evil act some legitimacy is more likely to make God weep than a few bad words. God did not and does not want his name put to actions and thoughts which are dishonorable, which oppress or take advantage of others. We could make a similar parallel with the other commandments, moving from the personal to the community. Having a Sabbath day, for example, something we often all struggle with. But it's not just good for us as individuals, it helps set the pattern of a community which values rest, which values taking time to be still, to spend time with family, to worship. And honouring our mothers and fathers is about more than just doing what our parents tell us to do. It's about honouring the generation that came before us, respecting them and looking after them. We can tell a lot about the values of society by the way they treat their elderly. All the commandments matter in terms of this blueprint for life. But at the top of the list, the first important thing which we mentioned earlier is the command to worship God and only God. That's a hard one to persuade people of these days. We live in a society in which following your own truth and not hurting anybody else is often considered more important than a common belief on which to base our desire for the common good. There's nothing wrong with recognizing diversity of opinion and belief, and it is good, very good, to find common ground with people of all faiths and none. But the commandments tell us that if we really want things to fall in the right order, the order that God intended, then we need to put him first. Why? Because when we stop putting God first, all too easily we find ourselves enslaved again. Usually what we're enslaved by is our own human weakness. Our second reading gave an example of what happens when human weaknesses such as greed or a lust for power take over even in a place that's supposed to be dedicated to God. So the event takes place during Passover, a festival in which Jews from all around the world came to Jerusalem to remember and give thanks for their freedom from slavery. The law required them to pay a temple tax and to offer a perfect sacrifice. The temple authorities and money changers had turned what should have been a service of exchanging money and checking the sacrifices for blemishes into a profit-making enterprise. A perfect sacrifice sold in the temple might cost 15 times what it costs to buy one outside the temple that would then be rejected. So the poor were sometimes left having to choose between fulfilling their religious obligation and being considered, between failing to fill their religious obligation and being considered sinners or getting into debt. Jesus was enraged. You know, we often hear about Jesus meek and mild but there's nothing meek and mild about Jesus' response here. What should have been an opportunity for all to celebrate freedom was being used to exploit and to marginalize and to exclude. And in his anger, Jesus, in a sense, swore. I'm not saying he used bad language, but he did use the name of God to command the scene. He ordered the exploiters out of the temple in his father's name. Imagine how startling it would have been, far more startling than if I were to go here right now and send that table flying, which I won't do in case somebody gets a, a roll in the eye. The temple authorities and money changers weren't breaking any law by doing what they were doing, but they were striking at the spirit of the law. In the very place where their focus should have been on God as covered by the first three commandments and on love for their neighbor as covered by the rest, they were instead denying their poorer neighbors. It's not hard to find similar examples these days. All the publicity there's been recently, for example, about charities and some of the exploitation that they believe is going on. As I said the other week, I don't think we should use this as a reason not to support the charities who do such good work. But it's a reminder of how important it is to have robust structures and systems of accountability that keep some of our less pleasant human tendencies at bay. But what do we do when the structures themselves are exploitative or unfair? From our gospel story, it looks like we should be overturning tables. 
I'm not suggesting getting a party up here to push the communion table down. Might take a few of us. Or that we head downstairs and wreak havoc in the hospitality area. But we can and we must address ourselves to overturning unfair and exploitative practices where we find them. It's Fair Trade Fortnight this week. I read something the other day which suggested that we should look at the fair trade mark as a symbol of righteous anger. The fair trade movement arose out of two drives, which sound incompatible, but they aren't. Compassion and anger. We sometimes water it down into a kind of a nicey-nicey, wishy-washy thing to do. I'll buy this fair trade coffee, it'll make me feel a little bit better, I'll get a pleasant buzz of virtue as I add it to my shopping basket. But at its heart, fair trade is not wishy-washy. It arose from a desire to throw the exploitative merchants out of the temple, so to speak. To overturn tables of unreasonable profit margins and unjust working practices in order to ensure that ordinary farmers and workers got a fair deal and a chance to feed their families. So perhaps we shouldn't feel a glow of virtue when we buy fair trade. Perhaps instead we should feel the burn of righteous anger that it's still necessary to do this. That so many in our world, to so many, life is still brutally, radically unfair and far from the beautifully ordered creation that God intended. The thing about anger, when it's properly directed and inspired by compassion, is it can change things. And we're the only ones who can change things. We were put in charge of creation. It's our responsibility, collectively, to look after the world and its people. One of the encouraging things when you go into schools these days is the emphasis that's placed in education on looking after the world. This new generation is growing up aware they cannot take the Earth's gifts for granted. I hope and I pray that they will also learn and practice the power of collective action and not find their passion diluted by experience of the so-called real world. I also pray that this generation, growing up in a more secular and individualistic environment, can find that when you put God first, it's possible to find both freedom and order, both passion and compassion, and a vision for a world where we really do look after each other. I'm sure William, like his big brother Roy, will learn many things as he grows, from Katie and Richard, from his grandparents, his godparents, his school, his activities, and all the people he meets. I hope that among his many lessons, he learns that there's a way of living that doesn't depend on his own strength or virtue, but on the steady strength of God. That there's a way of loving which extends beyond those he knows and cares for and includes those God calls him to care for. I even hope that sometimes he'll be angry. Sorry, Richard and Katie. Not with the toddler's tantrums, but when his heart burns at the injustice being done to others. And I hope he will learn to challenge, to channel that righteous anger into loving and life-giving action. We're all called sometimes to overturn tables, not to vent our emotions or to get our own way, but to restore the compassionate order of God, an order designed to help us all live freely and well. In the name of the Father, the Son, in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing again in response to God's word. And this is a song of challenge, reminding us that Jesus is waiting for us to join in with his work. Jesus Christ is waiting.
seated. See, I told you it was okay to dance. It's even in the song itself. I had a vision there, which was lovely. If we had no, no cues at all of, of a big circle dance with everybody moving along at this kind of stately circle dance place, but, but still dancing with their, with their hearts full. We're going to come to God with our, our prayer for others now. Um, I'm going to combine that with the dedication prayer. So, um, Betty, is it you who's got the offering? Was it? Yeah, Margaret, you just, just want to bring it forward now, and then you can take it back at the... Um, at the um, just go and sit down again for the prayer. My apologies for not telling you of that change of plan. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you for a morning of promise. The promise of new life in baptism. The promise of order in our sometimes chaotic lives. The promise of generosity shown in our offerings. The promise that Jesus is waiting for us to join in with his work in the world. As we dedicate our offerings to you of money and time and talent, we pray that they will help support those who need them most. There are so many needs in the world, Lord, that it is easy to feel helpless. And yet you give to each one of us opportunities to make a difference. Help us to see and take those opportunities, however large or small, even if sometimes it means overturning a table or two. In this fair trade fortnight, we pray in particular for small farmers and traders the world over. Help us to use what power we have as consumers and activists to overturn unjust or unfair structures which benefit the rich far more than the poor. All too often it's the disorder of war and violence which disrupts people's lives and livelihoods. And so we pray for voices of peace and reconciliation to be heard and order restored. We remember all the displaced people of the world, whether they are refugees, migrants, or homeless within our own country. Our weather in the last few days has reminded us just how vulnerable we can all be. Keep us attentive to the vulnerable in our community, those exhausted in heart, body, or mind, through grief, illness, caring responsibilities, living conditions, or stress. Thank you for the positive signs of community we've seen amidst the snow in recent days, locally and around the country. Neighbours looking out for each other, bringing in shopping, clearing roads and driveways, offering shelter and warmth to those stranded. Help us to continue to work together in your name, regardless of weather or circumstance, to make the world bright with promise. In Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of items of church news to draw your attention to. There are the, the, the notices which you can look at in the order of service yourself, but particular attention to the fact that it is our anniversary lunch next week. So if you'd like to join us, it's helpful if you can sign up. You can still turn up on the day, but if you sign up, then at least we've got an idea of numbers for catering. And we're going to be celebrating the fact that it's been 10 years since the rebuild of the building next, next week. Um, I've also got some photos which have been sent by Anne-Marie. Sometimes we get postcards from people. Anne-Marie has been in New Zealand with Bob for the last couple of months. And yeah, don't we just feel so sorry for them? Yeah, my heart weeps at all that sunshine and lack of snow. But anyway, it's lovely to be able to see that and they send their warmest greetings and they look forward to being here for the anniversary service on the Sunday. So we look forward to seeing them again. One more um, notice to bring to your attention. You, some of you will remember we've been kind of encouraging folk to do this Lent Love Project Challenge. First week we were talking about the hand of love and encouraging to write a handwritten note for somebody. Second week it was the voice of love and encouraging folk to make a phone call and call somebody to encourage them. This week it's the feet of love. And the suggestion for the feet of love is that you take a small gift, preferably handmade, or uh, if you're you know, like me, not very good at handmade stuff, you can get some flowers or something like that and physically bring it to somebody. Use your feet to get there as a sign of encouragement. In a funny way, this kind of weather actually makes more of us actually out and about sometimes as our cars are blocked in. So it is an opportunity to do that. You have another option to do with the feet of love and that is some of us are going on a trip in a few weeks time to Israel and Palestine. 
And those of you in the congregation may remember that in 2016, we raised money for Anne-Marie and Bob to do a bike ride in Israel-Palestine to raise money for a new pediatric ward at the Nazareth Hospital. Well, the new ward is due to open just shortly, and we're going to go to the Nazareth Hospital when we are in Israel-Palestine. So we thought it might be nice if those of you who often do the, the knitting and crafts and things like that, to, to bring along some small knitted teddies from the congregation for the, um, the kids in the, the pediatric ward. So Mark Faulkner has printed out patterns which are downstairs. I'm told they're dead simple. Um, so if anybody would like to have a wee go at knitting a teddy or two, you've got a deadline because we're going in about woo, four weeks' time, not long, just after, after Easter. So the deadline is actually Easter Sunday. Uh, so if anyone would like to rise to that challenge, then please do, and we can be the feet for you because we will take it in to the next stage. I'm going to finish today by singing our last song, Make Way, Make Way, which is often used as a, a beginning song, but it felt suitable here because it ends up with us finishing with a reminder of putting God first. There's an echo in this song, so I think we're going to do split the congregation in half for the echo. So let's see, what should we go? This side can start, make way, and this side can echo, make way, okay? If you're, you'll catch up, you'll catch on as you go along, and if you're singing the wrong bit, don't worry about it. But we'll start with this one echoing, the, starting the chorus, and that one echoing. Okay. that once again it mentioned dancing. Isn't that great? And so now let's go, feet ready to dance with joy, hands ready to overturn any tables of injustice that we find, arms open to welcome all. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.